Fleming College launches new program to address local health care needs. Daryl Knight, local journalism initiative reporter for The Standard. Kawartha Lakes. Fleming College is responding to the critical need for qualified personal support workers, PSWs, in Ontario by introducing its acclaimed PSW program to Lindsay's Frost campus this winter. Through an innovative mobile laboratory, the college will deliver state-of-the-art healthcare training to aspiring PSWs in the city of Kawartha Lakes. The Ontario government has estimated a requirement of up to 24,000 additional PSWs by 2026, underscoring the demand for skilled professionals in communities like Lindsay. Recognizing this need, Fleming College is making a significant investment in this area, providing training for 64 PSW students with modern equipment and resources designed to support a successful entry into healthcare careers. Over two semesters, students will undergo an intensive curriculum, including 400 hours of combined theoretical and hands-on laboratory experience in the mobile lab, supplemented by 300 hours of real-world training placements. This training model will prepare students to offer essential health care support within the community, both during their placements and after graduation. This mobile laboratory allows us to conveniently bring health care training into the heart of Lindsay and the surrounding regions, stated Fleming College President Maureen Adamson. These students will offer health care support to the local community during their placements and upon graduation. Lori Scott, MPP for Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock, praised the initiative. I am thrilled to see Fleming College take such a proactive approach in addressing the healthcare needs of our region. The introduction of this mobile PSW lab is a game changer for our community, providing accessible and high quality training right here in Lindsay. The mobile lab enables Fleming to offer the same respected PSW curriculum provided at its Sutherland campus without the need for renovating permanent facilities. While the program will be based at Frost Campus in winter of 2025, the mobile unit has the flexibility to expand to additional communities, extending Fleming's commitment to enhancing healthcare accessibility across the region. Through this program, Fleming College aims to supply the city of Kawartha Lakes with highly skilled PSWs, equipping students with essential skills and resources to make a meaningful impact in their local healthcare systems. Cougog Councillors received Budget Overview for 2025. Daryl Knight, Local Journalism Initiative Reporter for The Standard. Scugog. Work is underway on the 2025 Municipal Budget, with Treasurer Laura Barta recently presenting a report on the 2025 Budget Planning Process to Scugog Councillors, which spotlighted the requests highlighted by the Members of Council. Community and Council engagement is expected to play a significant role as priorities are set for the upcoming year's expenditures. In June, staff requested council members to submit a list of projects they felt should be considered in the 2025 budget. This list, provided by July 15, allowed the township staff time to evaluate community impact and gather preliminary cost estimates. The proposed projects sorted into categories like roads, parks, recreation, culture, and facilities were presented in Ms. Barta's report, along with the cost estimates and staff comments. These priorities will help Council and the community better understand key projects and their associated challenges. One notable area is infrastructure, where nearly $6 million has been proposed for road work, including a $2 million investment in Cedar Grove Road and $2.7 million to upgrade Old Scugog Road. In addition, the report identified projects for new or enhanced facilities, such as a replacement or refurbishment of the Blackstock Arena, $20 million for replacement or $3.4 million for repair, improvements to Cartwright Fields in Nestleton, and expanded trail access around Perry View Storm Water Pond. During a discussion on the budget report, Ward 4 Councillor Robert Wright raised the possibility of including line painting, as several local roads have been recently rehabilitated, and having lines painted would be a logical next step towards completing those projects. Replying to the question, Director of Public Works and Infrastructure Grant Taylor noted, The township does not currently have a policy on line painting. One of the challenges we have to correct very quickly is the fact that we don't have a policy on line painting, explained Mr. Taylor. We need to have a consistent approach to the roads we paint and those we don't. Under minimum maintenance standards, there's different classifications of roads. Ideally, I'd like to ensure Class 3 and 4 roads are painted, 
However, this is something which will have to be brought forward fairly quickly to Council for your approval. Given Skugog's over $500 million in assets and limited funding, Treasurer Barda noted, prioritizing essential infrastructure repairs is key to extending asset life while meeting community needs. However, some projects may be delayed or adjusted based on resources, coordination requirements, and regulatory restrictions. While the report was informational, the Council emphasized it offers an important look at potential fiscal and planning considerations for the coming year. The budget development process will continue with additional input from the community and Council providing a clearer picture of Skugog's 2025 priorities as discussions proceed. Experts looking for more information to decide the future of the Zephyr Library. Dan Kearns, The Standard, Uxbridge. The Township of Uxbridge is going to look for more information before they make any decisions on what to do with the Zephyr Library. A report from Amanda Ferraro, the Township's Director of Community Services, explained, The Uxbridge Public Library Board has been looking at ways to improve services in Zephyr. This includes releasing a survey in the summer to ask the community if amalgamating the Zephyr Library and the Zephyr Community Hall would be an option. The survey saw 146 people respond. The report was seen by Council at a meeting on Monday, October 7th. Of the 146 respondents, 42% said they were satisfied with the current state of the Zephyr Library. 36% stated they visit the Zephyr Library on a monthly or weekly basis, but a matching number stated they rarely or never visit the Zephyr Library. However, when asked if the Zephyr Library would benefit from additional space for either preschool, youth, or adult programs, the responses were mostly positive, with most answers being either strongly agree, agree, or neutral, the report stated. Integration of the Zephyr Library with the Zephyr Community Hall was not received well, with 71% wanting to keep the library at its current location and make improvements to the current building. 33% stated they would strongly oppose the integration. The main reason being, they did not want the library space to interfere with the Zephyr Hall space, making it smaller. However, 63% said they would support the facility integration if the library had no impact on the existing main hall space. Additionally, 60% selected very important when asked how valuable a community hub is for residents. The report recommended staff be directed to investigate the cost of retaining an architect to investigate the potential budget of an addition to the Zephyr Library and or the Zephyr Hall. It also recommended to have the cost to retain the architect be referred to the 2025 to 2026 budget deliberations. However, councillors felt it was too early in the process to go down this route. I think there's probably a little more information which would be helpful for the committee to consider moving forward, Ward 4 Councillor Willie Pop stated. Mayor Dave Barton agreed, calling a motion to ask for more information on the right direction. My concern with hiring the architect is we could spend $100,000 on design without a long-term budget plan on what we can do with that. It just feels too early, he added. Ward 3 Councillor Zed Pickering said he was proud of the level of community consultation which has been done in regards to this issue. Councillors later voted to receive the report and refer it back to township staff to provide council with more information. Brock Reviews Capital Project Progress Daryl Knight, Local Journalism Initiative Reporter for The Standard, Brock Councillors recently convened to assess the progress of various capital projects funded in the 2024 budget year. The report, provided by the then-manager of Parks, Recreation, Facilities, and IT, alongside input from the Director of Public Works and the Treasurer, was included on the Council meeting agenda for Monday, September 23rd. It highlighted both completed and ongoing initiatives aimed at improving community infrastructure. Among the notable projects discussed, the delivery of an electric Zamboni for the Sunderland Arena is scheduled for spring of 2025. This new unit is expected to serve both Sunderland and Cannington during renovations, demonstrating the Council's commitment to upgrading local facilities. Council also celebrated the completion of essential repairs at Thora Island Dock. These involved the installation of new connecting hardware and the repair of a leaking finger dock. 
Meanwhile, the design of the King Street track in Beaverton is still underway, and revised concept plans for McLeod Park have been received and will be presented to the Council in due course. The report noted Council is keen on expanding recreational opportunities, with plans for new pickleball courts in Beaverton and Cannington. The Beaverton Court will be integrated into the King Street Park project, while Cannington's Court is in progress following adjustments to accommodate a larger basketball court as previously approved by Council. During discussions, Regional Councillor Mike Jubb inquired about the status of the Cannington Park Pavilion, which should be reaching a milestone in the coming weeks. Currently, the status of this project is, the plans have been completed, they have been moved over to an engineering firm for their stamp, and once we have those back, we will be putting it out to tender, commented Wayne Ward, Director of Parks, Recreation and Facilities. Mr. Ward added there have been discussions with the Cannington Lions Club about fundraising for this project, but an amount would be determined once the project has been finalized through the tender process. Several additional projects are in various stages of completion, including play structure replacements with proposals for Cannington's McLeod Park, which have been solicited from three companies, and with King Street Park in Beaverton, replacements pending council decisions. The Beaverton Arena Auditorium renovation is currently in the planning stages. Delays have been encountered due to appliance decisions and architectural revisions. Updates have been communicated to the Beaverton Lions Club throughout the process. Moreover, projects involving security camera installations, LED retrofits for both Beaverton and Cannington libraries, and improvements at the Beaverton Town Hall for accessibility are also progressing. The report detailed outstanding projects from the 2024 budget, including a backup power generator for the Foster Hewitt Memorial Community Centre, which is pending load sizing confirmation before tendering. The Thora Island decking repairs are slated for RFP insurance with anticipated completion in October. Additionally, several projects from previous years are still ongoing or awaiting completion, including masonry repairs for municipal buildings and enhancements at the Sunderland Arena, which are currently budgeted together for $7,600,655.69. The report emphasized the importance of these projects to enhance community facilities and services underscoring a commitment to maintaining and improving infrastructure throughout the township. Future discussions will continue as the Council seeks to address outstanding items and explore further enhancements to the community. Simply thankful. A cool shower, a warm jacket on a cool day, a blanket and a good movie, and or a meal of your favorite comfort food. We have so much in this land we live in, yet there are those who don't have these simple things. A genuine way to appreciate this properly is to make an effort to help others be able to experience some of these as well. There are many efforts in our coverage area, from city, municipal, and provincial programs to various church and parachurch outreach works happening. What is needed by each is hands and hearts. Hands to reach and assist those in need, and hearts to convey the genuine care and concern for those who need the touch of love. Money is always needed but never replaces the active participation of real patient people. I can hear the knee-jerk response of some. I've earned the things I have. I'm grateful, but why should I give that away? Can't they just get a job and earn it too? Well, you may not realize it, or you may never have given it thought, so that's why you haven't seen it, but circumstances have to conspire together so a person can find a job and keep it, especially today when companies are barely keeping themselves in the black. They have to hire people for only a short while to reach the next point of success. This leaves the job market fickle. Some areas are struggling to find good, committed workers, while others cannot keep enough work to keep good employees. In these climates, it can make it hard for an employer to invest the time to help a new person grow in the skills they need. Still, people need time to grow, even if they are seasoned workers. Time is needed for a new employee to adjust to the way in which things are done in a particular company. Those who have little experience or a measure of personal struggles can be looked at as an inconvenience and a drain on time and others' personal energy and productivity. This can provoke the thought of just cutting the loss and letting a person go, leaving them back in the vacuum of cold and hard-heartedness on the streets, without the safety of the next needed paycheck. So, is it on us or on them? The answer is yes. We have an obligation to every life we meet. 
every life. It's one of reciprocity, the idea of cause and effect. When a stone is cast in the water, the waves move out in concentric rings, and even though the farther they go, the smaller the effect may seem, they do reach and influence the shore on the other side of the lake. This is like every action we take, or choose not to take. You see, when we choose not to act, to show kindness or patience to another, that is still an action. It's like when you expect to be able to lean on a wall to catch your breath because you just went through some exhausting ordeal, and the wall is an illusion. You would fall through and collapse, maybe injuring yourself in the process. So this could leave a person in worse shape than before they reached out to trust the wall. So if you find you are nervous to interact with those in need, be they in a coffee shop or on the street and asking for help, or a neighbor over the fence, just remember circumstances have probably conspired to bring them to their point of need. You've heard the phrase, but for the grace of God, there go I. It's a statement of empathy, the realization many of the elements of what one can be thankful for are not of one's own doing. Instead, they are an outflow of the grace being dispensed through opportunities we have stumbled into. This statement affirms the effort of God on our behalf to get us through these doors in life. As far as nervousness is concerned, a simple short scripture addresses this. The one who is gracious to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay them for their good deeds. Proverbs 19.17, New English Translation, NET. This is a kind of lending ourselves to the use of the Lord as he reaches those in need with the thankfulness with the thankfulness we revel in in our lives. Like walking around among people with a full bucket of clean water, some of it's going to spill on others, or maybe we can even pour some out on purpose, and no, lives, dry and dirty from circumstances, are refreshed and become a little cleaner. Like the scripture says here, the Lord will repay you for your good, and you may wind up having even more overflow to share as you go forward. The first Thanksgiving was celebrated by settlers on their first harvest at Plymouth Colony, the site of their first landing. There was the sharing of fowl like pheasant, geese, and other wild birds. It is written the colony ate corn and herbs, and what they gleaned naturally like mussels, lobsters, grapes, and plums. They were generously received by a nearby indigenous people, the Wampanoag, who hunted and brought five deer to the celebrations. Their leader, Massasoit, and ninety others from the village shared in the mutual thanksgiving to God the Creator for the harvest and bounty of friendship. The celebration lasted three days. It wasn't a hit-and-run approach. There was plenty of time to genuinely begin to grow connections and real friendships. This increased the sense of security for both groups of people, as protection of each life increases in numbers. Interesting. People, worlds apart, came together in a common celebration to the Creator of all things. Talk about an environment of food insecurity. We have nothing to hold back for, really. This Thanksgiving, let's share the comforts we so richly enjoy, especially our ability to engage with others. We all have need. Maybe, where you don't even realize you have much, this can begin to fill the vacuum in another's life. Being thankful on Thanksgiving. Huh, what a concept. Happy seasoning. Welcome to You've Got to Be Kidding, a podcast that offers a different perspective of life around us. Listen now to author Jonathan Van Bilsen. Printed claims have always carried an air of authority, but over the years, organizations like the Advertising Council of Canada have worked to safeguard the public from misleading information. However, advertising has not always been held to such high standards. Take, for example, the processed food industry, which has long played a game of presenting unhealthy products as nutritious. This trend began as early as the 1910s, when vitamins were first discovered. By 1942, advertisements for products like vitamin donuts were circulating, promising health benefits that seem laughable now. However, even today, some brand images stick despite questionable merits. Ovaltine, marketed as a health drink, is a prime example. Though it is essentially powdered chocolate milk, the company behind it, Nestle, known for treats like Butterfinger and haagen continues to push this message. The marketing of sugary beverages follows a similar pattern. In the 1950s, ads for 7-Up promoted the idea that soda could help babies grow strong and healthy. These claims stand in stark contrast to modern concerns about childhood obesity, a condition closely tied to excessive sugar consumption. 
Research has repeatedly shown how harmful refined sugars are, especially for children. Then there's the notorious case of cigarette advertising. Camel cigarettes in particular became infamous for featuring doctor endorsements in their campaigns. Starting in 1948, these ads cleverly twisted medical opinions, a practice mirrored by nearly every cigarette company. Chesterfield's 1953 ads even used misleading data to suggest that smoking had no adverse effect. Meat advertising post-World War II also leaned heavily on health claims. Eating more red meat, according to ads from 1940s and 50s, was touted as a way to stay trim and fit. The American Meat Institution, which orchestrates these campaigns, still operates today. Few people, however, are aware that nutritionists generally recommend limiting red meat consumption to just two or three servings a week. Concerns over sodium nitrite in processed meats were similarly downplayed by the industry. Sugar companies in the 1960s attempted to convince consumers that eating sugary snacks before meals would help them eat less. A 1969 campaign even advised people to drink soda or snack on a candy before lunch. The logic behind these ads remains puzzling, and the campaign itself lacked a clear company name, though it did offer a mailing address for sugar information. In another bizarre chapter of early advertising, the 1920s saw the rise of Violet Rays. The Violet Rex device, which plugged into a light socket, promised to cure virtually any ailment. It was not until the 1950s, after numerous recalls and lawsuits, that the FDA finally banned the product's manufacture. I guess we've grown to become more intelligent, because we will never believe anything we read. Except, of course, my column. I'm Jonathan Manbilson, and this is You've Got to Be Kidding. You've Got to Be Kidding was presented by X4 Media, with permission from the Standard Media Group. We endeavor to make all information contained in this program as accurate as possible at production time. X4 Media and the Standard Media Group are not responsible for any liabilities resulting from information contained in this program. For more information, please visit x4media.ca. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper. 